Hello, hello, welcome to a new video. So, as you may be able to see, we are back with the cabin project. I said I would be back with some bonus steps and I am going to deliver. So, we're just gonna just jump straight into it, I think. Let's not mess about. What we're going for is this. So, hopefully you can see, but there is a nice, subtle, uh, little flickering effect going on with that window. If we just move in a little bit closer, you should be able to see that that's happening. So you can see that it's just looking like there's a light behind that that's flickering and it looks beautiful, even if I say so myself. So in this first part of the bonus steps, we're going to get this working. So you can see I've already made like a, an example. And what I'll do is I'll go back to the original shader. So I'll just swap that one back in. And that's what we had originally. So we need to get that flickering effect going on. So let's just close that one we need to open the window material. So this is what we left off with when we made the window material originally. And what we're gonna do now is just take these two nodes out here, because these are the ones going into the emissive color. We're gonna bring them out because we're gonna do a little bit more playing with them. So, there it is. So at the moment, I'm fairly happy with this part here. This is doing what I need it to do. We have an emissive color and it's been multiplied. But what we wanna do is get something to change how strong that's happening, how strong the multiplication of that value is. And so to do that, we're gonna bring in a, a normal map actually, and we're gonna pan that, and you'll see how it all works, it's very clever. So, first thing I'm gonna do, is stick in a multiply node here. There it is, lovely, lovely. And we're gonna ping this into A, and we'll, we'll connect it all up at the end. Into B, we need to do some um, cleverness. So we'll get from B and we're going to do a texture sample. Uh, where is it? There it is. And what I want is a normal map. So if we go into here, and I'm gonna go for burnt wood, just because when I tried it, I liked that one the best. So this is what it gives us. We can see the normal map there. And what I want to do is get that moving so that uh, we can have the values change and that'll make sense in a minute. So into the UVs, we're going to place a panner. And the job of this node is to just move textures um, in the, kind of the X axis or the, the Y axis. So I'll just pull that out. And what we'll do just to get this moving, we're going to just, uh, if we do one, by one, just so you can see how that works. And that will pan this, but at the moment we're not gonna see anything because I don't have live nodes and live update turned on. So we'll turn that on, or both of those on. And then as this updates, you will see that this moves. There it goes. So you can see that that is now panning that texture across the, the texture space. But this won't work at the moment because it's just not strong enough. So what we're gonna do is make that look a little bit bigger. So into this panner, we're going to add a uh, texture coordinate node, if I can spell it right. Texture coordinate, lovely. And then we're going to zoom right in on this texture. And the value we're gonna use, or the values we're gonna use on the tiling are 0 0.0001. So we're making it very small, which makes it really zoom in. And the same on the other one, so 0 0.0001. And when I press enter, you'll see just here, when this updates, that what it, instead of you seeing the whole texture panning across, it's just gonna look like the blue values are going up and down, which is exactly what we want it to look like. Okay, so there it is and you can see that that is now going kind of crazy, which might be what you're going for, but I want it to be a little bit more subtle than that. So in order to change that, we're gonna go into our panner, and instead of having a speed of one, which is far too much, we're gonna have 0 0.001, I believe, 0 0.001. And then we'll let that update, and we we'll, should see a more gradual changing of the blue values. Okay, so that's now updating, and I can see that the blue values are changing, but I don't think they're really changing quickly enough for me, so I'm gonna experiment with the numbers until I find something I like. Okay, so with a bit of experimentation, I've put in values of 0 0.007 into the speed X and the speed Y, 
and I'm happier with the way that these values are changing. I think that's going to look quite good when we put it all together. Okay, so what I want to do now, we can see that this is all going into here, and I want to see how that's going to look. Uh, and I'll give you a hint, it's going to look wrong, but I'll explain why. So what I'm going to do is go to this multiply node, and I'm going to start previewing that node, which should put that value up here. And you can see what's happening is that instead of just raising or lowering the intensity of that emissive value, it's just mixing the colours. So we're getting reds, blues, greens. It doesn't look very good. I don't like it. So the reason for that is because we're mixing all three channels. And all we want is, are the values from the blue channel. So instead of going from this value here, this output, we're going to go to the blue one and put that in B instead. And then when that updates and we see it up here, what you should see is that we're just starting to get that flickering effect. So the strength of it may not be right yet, but the effect is actually happening. So what we'll do now is just stop previewing this and we're going to put this now into the emissive color to replace what we had connected before and this will then show us what it's going to look like as a finished material okay so we can now see that that's happening but we need to go into the level and see how well that's happening if it's something that we want or if we need to tweak it a little bit so let's save that and then we'll go out into the level and see what it looks like. Okay, so I'm just going to dock this window up here. Zoom out a little bit to see if this effect is strong enough. Um, it's actually not bad. I might want to just dial it up a little bit. But overall, I'm quite happy. That's not a bad, a bad outcome really, is it? So I think what I'm going to do is this multiply here. I'm actually going to tone this down. Because I don't want it to be really bright all the time. So I'm going to bring this down to about 5. And that means that now this emissive effect is not going to be very strong at all. But we're going to supercharge this side of the equation here. So I'm going to put in a new multiply. Multiply. And so the result of that is going to go into B. And our blue value is going to go into A of this new multiply. And then what we're going to do is multiply this by about 12. And I might come back and change this value. But we'll go with 12 for now. And then we'll see how that comes out. Okay, so it's definitely doing something. Let's go save it back out to the level. And see if we prefer this outcome to the previous one. I do. So I think what it's done now is it's made it brighter overall. And that means that up here we can see that that value is dropping up and down which gives the effect, hopefully, that there's some kind of fire burning in there and that will work with the, the smoke coming out of the chimney. So, that brings us to the end of this first step. It's very exciting getting back into this project. Hello there, you beautiful 3D artists. Right, so we're back. It's time for another step, so let's have a look. In this step, what we're going to do is take a look at tessellation. So, as you can see, I've dropped back into the first-person example map just to show you this effect in isolation. So on screen, I've got two of the rocks that we created. The one on the left, let's see, this one here, he has no tessellation. And this one here has tessellation and can displace as we get closer to it. So as we run in, well, let's just click in here. As we run in, you should see that this rock becomes a little bit more jagged. It gets more of an outline on it. Okay. So you should be able to see as we walk around it, it just looks more jagged. And that's the displacement that's doing that. So what I'll just show you is what that looks like in wireframe. So you can see the one on the left is made of very few triangles. And the one on the right has lots and lots of triangles. And that's happening dynamically as a result of this tessellation. So as we move back, you should see that those triangles start to disappear. And the, the number of triangles looks about the same. And as we get closer... The triangles are split into smaller and smaller triangles and it displaces and starts all like that. So in this video we're going to look at how you go about setting that up. Okay so here we are now back in the main level that we've been building and I'm going to use this um, displacement effect on these three rocks here that create this little cluster to make them look a little bit more interesting as the player runs towards them. If you wanted to you could just change the shader over on the rock in the static mesh editor and that would change it for all of them. But you need to keep in mind is that this tessellation can be an expensive thing to render. So you should use it sparingly and where you're going to get a lot of impact out of it. Okay, so what we need to do then is we have our rock material. And what we'll do first of all is create a copy of that so that we can work on that without 
breaking the original. So let's right click on here and we'll go to duplicate. Now this for me is going to be called M underscore rock two because I've already done this once just to make sure it was all working. So there it is, M underscore rock two and we will open that up. Here it is and I'm just going to ping that up into my docking area. So this is the material as it stands. So I'm just going to get all of these parts that make it up already and just move those up a little bit because I'm going to put the displacement stuff down here. So let's get into it. Right, so the first step here is to have a look here. We've got World Displacement, Tessellation Multiplier. These currently aren't available. So the, the base node isn't set up to have any tessellation. So what we're going to do is change that. So click on the node and we're going to scroll down. You have to scroll down quite a long way until you find the tessellation section. And you can see that by default, no tessellation. So let's open that up. And for this one, we're going to try flat tessellation. If you want to have a go at PN triangles, then knock yourself out. But for today, we're going to do flat tessellation. And then you can see that the displacement and the tessellation multiplier become available. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is just put a, um, a node into the tessellation multiplier. So I'm just going to have a scalar parameter so that we can change this later. So I'll put that into the multiplier. We will give it the name of tess multiplier so that I know what that is later. The default value is going to be 5. No, maybe 0 0.5. And I'm going to leave the min and max alone so I can just have that whatever I would like it to be. So that's that bit done. We'll just put that there. And now we've got to get into this world displacement to get that going. Okay, so one of the first nodes that we need is called a vertex normal WS node. This little chappy here. And he needs to go into a multiply. Uh, it's going to be in the A of the multiply. And the output of this multiply is going to be the thing that we plug into the world displacement. So we'll pop that in there. And then into the B, we actually need to do a couple of other things. So we're going to need a texture sample, uh, which is right here. And this texture sample is going to be the displacement that I put in with the texture files that you can download. So. We're going to have a look in here and search for rock. And there should be this rock displacement. That's the one we're going to use for this. Okay, there we go. And what we need to do is actually multiply this by a number. And that's going to be based on how far um, it can displace out from the original mesh. So we're going to put another scalar for that. And this one is going to be called tessellation distance. Like so. And the default value for that one will have at 5. And then we might want to change this later. In fact, let's just set it to 15 so that we're definitely going to see something happening. And then these two values need to be multiplied together and put into B of our original multiply. So let's just get this out of here and get a multiply. Groovy. And then we're going to put in the texture sample into A and the distance into B. Yay! Okay, so that should be all set up. Okay, now, so for the sake of neatness, we're going to put all these nodes together, select them, press C on the keyboard, and we're going to call this displacement. So that if we ever come back to this material, like, what are all these doing? We will know what they're doing. So, let's move that down there a little bit. That's now good to go. So we're going to save this material. And now that's saved, we're going to go back to our level and we're going to create a material instance so that we can change the parameters on that. So let's right click on this rock two that we've created, or in your case, it'll be called rock one. And we're going to create a material instance from that. So I'm going to leave that at M underscore rock two inst. And this will be the material that will apply to these three rocks. So with that selected in the content browser, what I'll do is select a rock and then on the material slot here, I'm just going to click on the little arrow and that will swap that over. And you can see straight away the outline of that change. So that's already displacing. And then we'll do the same on this one here. And then the last one. Boo. So that's already working really nicely. So what I'll do is just test that out. So I'll go into play. And as we run towards it, we should be able to see that it gets a little bit more jagged. And this is actually all I would really do with it. It's quite subtle. Uh, and I like it that way. 
but you could really push it so that you can see that it's happening. But just to prove that it's happening, if we go into wireframe mode by pressing F1, we can now zoom in. You can see that it is subdividing the number of triangles, which is good. As we move out, they get lessened in and out, in and out. So it is doing its job exactly as we wanted it to. But if you want to see the effect of that happening a little bit more, what we can do is open up the material instance. And we'll just make it so that we can see this and the rock. And if we open up or enable these parameters that we set up, and let's just make this a little bit brighter so we can see what we're doing. What we'll do now is mess with these parameters. So if we change the distance, I think the top one is, you can see that that now displaces more. So you can go like too far with it, ah, like that, not good. Um, but if you keep it sort of reasonable, you can have it add a lot more variation to the rocks than we had previously. And then if we change this multiplier, you won't see much happening, but what that's doing is allowing it to subdivide into more triangles than it did originally. So I'll show you that happening in wireframe mode. And if we change this multiplier here, you can see that that's allowing it to use more or fewer triangles. So let's make it go just as far as that, like that. And then we'll save this instance and we'll give it another test when we press play. So now as we get closer to these rocks, we should see that they are a little bit more jagged and look more like rocks. So that's working, well done. Hello there, beautiful people. So in what is going to be this final step of the bonus steps, we're going to put together a water shader and we're gonna create a little lake. So you can see the outcome on screen in front of you. And the way that I've built this, so this is the shader and this is the material that I put together to be able to get that. So what we'll be doing in this video is rebuilding this, talking about what the different things do, and then we'll build this little lake. And we'll just show you how the lake looks when you have a kind of run around it. So you can see that the the water looks kind of like it's got all the ripples on it. It's a nice calm lake. It's doing its thing. Uh, but I've also got a post-processing volume sitting just underneath it as well, so that when we jump in the water, uh, it kind of makes it go all blue and a bit dark and a bit blurry. Um, so if we kind of jump in and out, try again. So if we jump in and out, you'll be able to see that kind of turning on and off as well. So we're going to set about creating that in this video. It's going to be a fairly long one. Uh, there's a lot to get through, so I'm not going to explain absolutely everything. I just want to kind of rattle through it as it is a bonus step. So stick with it. And if you do have any questions, drop them below and I'll answer them if I can. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is just create somewhere for this lake to be. So I've already got one um, just here, as you can see. So I'm going to put another lake just over here somewhere so you can choose wherever you want to put yours. So in order to do that, I need to be back in my landscape editing mode. I'm going to use my sculpt tool. Uh, yep, I've got a nice big brush. Let's just find where I want it to be. And I'm going to hold shift on my keyboard just to make sure that I'm pulling that down like that. So there we go. This is really going to anger my light maps. Okay, and I just want to have a look at how deep that is. Make sure I've not overdone it. Oh, that's pretty good. Nice and dark in there. Yeah, that'll do it. So I'm not too concerned with the shape because this is just to demonstrate. And if I was doing this um, in a real project, I'd take a lot of the grass out as well and probably change it for like underwatery weeds and stuff like that. But for what I want now, I've just created myself uh, a little area for the lake and I can now get on to filling that with some water. So the next thing we need is the uh, the mesh that we're going to apply the water shader to. Uh, and there is one included. Let's just go back into place mode. And if I search here for plane, this shape plane is literally just a polygon square. So I'm going to drop this into the scene, into the level rather. And you can see it's pretty small. And it needs to be bigger. So let me just scale this bad boy up wrong way yeah that's it so I want this to fill the area where my water is going to be and then I'm just going to move it into place so you should be able to see how I'm doing this okay and then I just want to get the height of it right as well 
So I think something like that. So that's my mesh, that's in place. There are no collisions on it because I want to be able to go under the water. So if I just hit play again and run into this, I should be able to just get under it. Ah, no I can't. I need to turn collisions off. So let's do that. Okay, so the way that we're gonna turn collisions off on this is just click on the mesh itself. We're gonna scroll down in the details panel and we're looking for this collision area and the collision presets at the moment is set to default and I'm gonna set that to no collision. And then I'll just give that a little test to make sure that I can run beneath it. Wonderful. Okay. So that is now ready for our shader, which we'll start building now. Okay. So the first thing I'll do is go into my materials folder. I'm going to right click, create a new material. I'm going to call this M underscore Lake water. Seems as good a name as any, and we'll get that bad boy open. There it is. Just swap these around and this is what we have to begin with and we're going to need to make some changes to it because as you can see one of the things that we'll need for water is refraction which is not available to us so let's make sure that all the things that we need for water are turned on straight away so the first changes we'll make is we've got this material domain at surface we want to keep that as it is but the blend mode is set to opaque which means it can't be translucent and water is of course translucent so we're going to change that to the translucent option and you'll see at that point refraction becomes available but there are some others that we'll need such as the metallic specular uh, that are still unavailable so we also need to make those available so to do that we're going to scroll down a little bit further to this translucency section uh, I'm going to turn on this screen space reflections and this lighting mode which is currently set to this I'm going to change to surface translucency volume and you'll see most of these are now available to us so that we can plug in all the inputs that we need okay so i want to set this material up so that i can edit it within the actual editor so I, it, a lot of these will be parameters that i can use in an instance so i'm going to start with the opacity and i'm just going to put a scalar into this like so scalar parameter and we're going to set this up so i'm going to call it opacity and we're going to have a default value of 0 0.5 the minimum will be 0 and the maximum will be 1 okay so it's either going to be fully opaque or fully transparent and I'm going to start it somewhere in between and then I'll tweak it to my needs once it's actually on the mesh so that's the opacity taken care of the next thing I want to do because it's a nice easy one is the same for roughness so I'm going to put another scalar into here lovely and I'm going to set this up in the same way so I'm going to call it roughness and I'm going to start the default at 0 0.2 not very rough at all and the minimum is going to be 0 and the max is going to be 1 happy with that so that's two parameters set up so far so good well done Shane and now I'm going to repeat this for the specular and the metallic as well uh, now normally I wouldn't use metallic on any material that wasn't actually metallic but it can give a really nice sort of reflection to the water that really helps so let's get a scale it into the spec and I might choose not to use this but I still want it there uh, oh, let's put a capital letter on now it's gonna drive me crazy there we go and then um, we'll start that at zero and we'll have a max of I'm gonna leave that actually because I might want to go higher so we'll go for that one and I'm, you could also change the specular for a vector parameter as well which gives you colors that you could mess with okay so let's go into metallic and generally your metallic would just be zero or one it's either metallic or it's not but I quite like um, an in-between value on the water nope not scalar metallic there we go and it's going to start at a value of 0 0.5 I'll change it if I want to and the max is going to be 1 okay so that's pretty much all the easy inputs sorted now we'll move on to the stuff that's a little bit more complex so most of the rippling effect that you get on the water is is handled by uh, your normal map so that's going to be making it look that even though it's a flat plane that we're putting it on like it's got these ripples going on and they're going to go into the normal channel and I'm going to blend together two of the same normal map 
that are going in different directions to make it look a little bit like water. So to do that, I need two texture sample nodes. So I'm just going to hold T and left click to get those. Okay, I'm just going to put the normal stuff over here for now. Okay, and I want both of these texture samples to have the same normal map applied. So I'm going to select this and I'm going to choose water and I'm going to use the one that's included in the engine. You can find your own online. So I also experimented with another one here, Lake Water. Um, so you can find any water normal map to get different results or you can make your own. But I'm just going to use the one that's built in the engine, which is T underscore water underscore N. So I'll select it there and I'll also select it here. Now what I will need to do is get these to blend together. And I'm going to do that with a lerp node, which is a linear interpolate node. So linear interpolate, there it is. You see that shows up as a lerp. And what I'm going to do is put one of these into A, one of these into B. And the result is going to go into the normal of my main material node. Oh, because they've loaded in, so you can see what they're doing. What I need to do is get them moving. And I'm going to use a panner node. So like in the video where we made the uh, the window flicker, we use the panner node there. It's the same node, but we're going to use it for a slightly different purpose. So we need a panner going into each. So I'll put a panner in here. And that's going to go into the UVs. And another panner just here. And that's going to go into the UVs there. And we're going to use that to get these textures moving. Okay, so we need to set some, some parameters up on this. So I'm going to go for a very small value here. So 0 0.008 is one that I know I like for this. And I'm going to go 0 0.016 on the, the speed Y direction. And that will just make that texture move quite slow. And on this one, I want it to move in the other direction. So that's going to be minus at the beginning. And I'm going to do 0 0.03. And on this one, I'm going to do zero, oh, sorry, minus 0 0.07. Okay, and I'm going to give this a chance to catch up so you can see the preview here and show you that they're moving. Okay, so that's caught up. You can see it more on this one, which is moving faster, but you can see that that's now moving across. This one's moving slower, but in the other direction. So that's now going to be blended together and it will give us a ripply look. What we also want to do, though, is control how these are tiling to make sure they look the way we want them to look. So we're going to put a few more nodes on this side to get all that happening. So the first thing we'll need is a couple of texture coordinate nodes. So texture coordinate nodes. Okay, and we'll put a copy of that one in. And what these control is how many times your, your textures are tiled. So this one here, I'm going to leave at one. And for now, I'm going to change this in a sec, but for now, I'm going to put it into coordinate. And this one, I want to be slightly bigger. So I'm going to change these to 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. And that means that it will tile half as much as the other one. So I'll pop that into the coordinate as well. And then when these finish loading up, you'll see the differences in size, which will add to the random look of the water we're trying to create. So they've loaded in now. And you can see that it's the same normal map we're using, but the size looks very different. So that's going to give us a nice different um, look. Okay, so there's one more thing that I want to put into this before we call it done. And that is making sure that we can control the tiling of the water. So it'll be, end up looking like the size of the ripples, really. And I want to control that from the material instance as well. So we're going to need another parameter, which we'll call tiling, and we're going to need to use that to control these. So I'm just going to pop that here, and it's going to be another scalar. And I'm going to call it tiling. Okay, so the default value is going to be 1 on this. And there's going to be no min and max, because I might want to just go crazy with these. And then what I'll do to get this to work is I need two multiplies. One there. And one there. I might just need to make a little bit more space for this. What we'll do is this tiling parameter is going to go into B of both of these. The original value is going to go into A. 
and then the output is going to go into coordinate. And what that means is that using this parameter here, we can now control the, the values that are in here because we're going to use that and multiply. So that's pretty much done. So what I'll do, just so that I don't get lost, is I'll select all that and I'll comment it. And we're just going to call this, oh, yeah, normal. And I'll also put in there plus tiling, just so I don't forget. So that's that bit done. That's beautiful. What we'll do next is we're going to put a value into this refraction. So what I would like it to do, so at the moment we're looking at this um, value here and we can see straight through it. Now with water, it refracts when you look through it and it kind of makes um, what you see through the water sort of wobble around and we want to get the same effect. So we're gonna put something into refraction so that, that will happen on our shader. And for that, we're just gonna use another scalar, I'm using a lot of scalars today. Okay, and we're going to pop that into refraction like so, and we are going to call it refraction. And straight away, without having to do anything else, you can see that when we look through this shader now, it is refracting the background behind it. So that's beautiful. So I'm gonna leave all these values alone for now, and I can change them on the material instance later, but that's the refraction setup. So I'll just pop that over there. And so now the last thing that we really need to worry about is the color. And again, we're gonna use um, a parameter for this, or well, multiple parameters, but one thing that's really important here is that we use what's called a Fresnel node. Uh, and what a Fresnel is, is it's that, it, it simulates the phenomenon where if you're standing in water and you look down at your feet, you can pretty much see through the water. But if you look out towards the horizon, let's say standing in the sea, uh, the water stops being see-through and you can't, you, all you can see is what's been reflected on the surface. And your, your Fresnel, will allow that to happen as well. So we'll set that up and that's all gonna go into base color. So the first thing we need is a vector param. That says vector, <laughs> I've not spelled it right. Oh, Shaney. Okay, there's your vector param. By default, I want this to be white. Otherwise it's gonna make it look all crazy and I'll think I've done it wrong. So click on okay there. And what I want to do is push this through another lerp node. So lerp like so, uh, where is lerp, there it is. Okay, now, at this point, I'm copying the way that I saw someone else do it. So, I'm putting this into B. The reason I'm putting it into B is because that's what the other person did. I can't tell you anything other than that. Okay, and then what I'm gonna do is just put the result into base color. And then the Fresnel is gonna feed the alpha, and it's the alpha that, that lerps between the color. So, Let's set up that alpha. So the first thing that's gonna go in is this Fresnel node, which is spelled Fresnel. There it is, it's a utility. That's good to know. And the result of the Fresnel is gonna go into the alpha. And then we're gonna put some parameters into the inputs. So these are gonna be just two scalars again. So scalar, and we'll just copy that and put another one into these. Okay, so we're just gonna call this first one exponent in, exponent in, and the other one is gonna be called base reflect. Okay, and then we can change those in the material instance at will to get the result that we're looking for. Okay, so now what I'll do is just quickly change uh, or just tweak a couple of these parameters just to get them to something I'm happier with. So I want the metallic to be set to one, which it is. Um, I also want the roughness, I'm just gonna bring that down slightly to 0 0.1. And the opacity, I actually want to take all the way up to one. And then we'll wait for this to come out and that should give us a pretty nice watery look. Okay, so that's now finished doing that, and you can see that actually looks pretty nice. So the, the stuff that's being reflected behind it looks kind of watery, I like it. So let's save this, and then we'll put it onto uh, the mesh in a sec uh, after we've created our material instance. Okay, so we're gonna go back into the main level editor. Here we are, and there's the, oh, hello, there's the lake water that I've created. 
So I'm going to right click on that and create a material instance. I'm just going to leave the name at the default. Here it is. And I'm going to open that up. In fact, no, before I do anything with it, I'm going to add it to there. So I've got that selected and I'm going to go to... There you go. So it's got the basic wall material on it for now. I'm going to swap that with the water shade that we've created. And you can see straight away there are problems with it. It doesn't look quite right. Let's just frame that up so that we can uh, get a good look at it. So yeah, there are definitely things about it that I don't like, but some things that I do, you can see actually when it catches the light, it looks pretty nice. So we need to do some tweaking. Let's open up the instance. Here it is. I'm just going to tear that away so that I can see what I'm doing as well. Right. So the, the main thing that I need to change is the tiling. So the ripples are far too big. So I'm just going to knock that up to 10 to get me started. Oh, I might leave it at 10. That looks pretty nice. Maybe 12. Oh, it looks good, doesn't it? Right. So we've got that one set up. Now we need to have a play with a few other things. So we've got our color. And we can mess around with this. So let's have a look. Do I want to add a bit of blue to it? I might do a bit of bluey green. Yeah. That's pretty nice. Let's go back a bit more into the green spectrum. Bit bit pond watery then, isn't it? I don't want to have it be too strong. So, got a bit of colour in there. I also need to play with this base reflection and this exponent in to get the Fresnel effect. And you'll see that happening more in the preview here than on the water. But you'll get the idea. So let's turn them both on. And then we'll change the values. So on the base reflect, I actually like to go about minus 0 0.5 to get me started on this. And the exponent in, I'm going to go to about 1.2. And then you can see that you get this kind of haloed effect, which is what I'm going for. I'm going to have a little play with the metallic. And you can see that's having an effect on this as well. So I'm going to bring this down a touch. Maybe it's just something like 0.2-ish. Pretty good. The opacity, I'm going to have a little play with that. So I want it to be fairly strong. Again, you can see here, it's giving that really good Fresnel effect. So it's more see-through in the middle now where we're looking straight on. But when it kind of goes at an angle, it gets less see-through, which is good. That's what we want. So I'm going to go for something like 0.85. Pretty good. The refraction is how much um, this wobbles the things below the surface of the water. So if we have a look down, you can see that beneath the water, things are all wibbly, which is good. And we can change how much that happens. So if we up the refraction, you can see that that, that refracts. Pretty cool. So I don't want to overdo this. Something like that should be nice. Okay, and I can now see... I'm sure you saw this earlier in the video, but instead of calling this one spec, I called it scalar. What a mug. So I'll change that in a sec, but for now, let's see if I want to change this at all. Uh, yeah, I'll try it at about 0 0.8. That makes it a little bit brighter when the light hits it, doesn't it? <sighs> nice. So I don't really want it to show up as black when that happens. So that is pretty nice. And you can see that it's changing its values depending on what angle we're looking at it. Okay, so let's go back into the main material and make some changes. So I'm going to save this. Ooh, I'm going to go to my lake water. I'll just uh, move that out of my way for a minute. Right, that's called scalar. That will not do. Specular. Okay, I also want to comment this as Fresnel. Oh, Fresnel, not Fresnel. But it's Fresnel, isn't it? Okay, and this one, I'm just going to name color because I didn't name that. Okay, I'm going to save that and we'll call that material done. So what you could do now is spend hours playing with all the different properties of it to get it looking the way that you want. But I'm fairly happy with it on my lake as it is. And I just want to make some changes to what happens when you get in the water next. Okay, that took a little bit of saving, but it's finished now. So, let's go back out into our level and see if we like it. So, I'm pretty happy with it. Let me just hit the play button. So, as we get closer to it, and I need to have a look at what the Fresnel's doing. 
I might take that back down to zero. It's going to be a bit strange uh, what the refraction's doing. Not for now, refraction. So let's set that back to zero. 0 0.1. Okay, I'm just going to up my opacity a little bit as well. Right. So that will do for now. One other thing that's looking a bit strange is when we look up like that, the reflections are pretty good, but when we look down, we lose them. That's because we're doing screen space reflections. And I want to pair this with a reflection capture as well. So I'll just close this for now. And we're going to look in here for reflection capture. And we'll do a box reflection, I think. And you can see as soon as I place that over, the water looks a lot nicer because it's now using pre-computed reflections. And when I look up and down, I get a much more even result. There is a, a point where it swaps between the reflection capture and screen space reflections, which is a little bit noticeable, but it doesn't look as bad as it did before. So now if we have a little run towards this water, you can see that that's not bad at all. And when we look down, we can see through it. But when we look further out, we can't. So everything's looking pretty good so far, but we've got two problems with the under the water. First of all, the shape's one-sided, which means that when we look up, nothing happens. And um, everything underneath the water just looks the same. So what we'll do first of all is get this water to be not one-sided. So in order to do that, I'm just going to be quite lazy. Okay, so I need to select the plane, which I can't do by clicking on it apparently. So I'll do that. And I'm going to copy and paste it or duplicate it. So there you go. I just copied and pasted Control c and Control v to get plane 4. And what I'm going to do is the scale on the z-axis, which in Unreal Engine is the up and down axis, I'm going to set to minus. And what that should do is invert it. So if I just now look up, you can see it's having the effect. It's not quite working as I, I'd hoped, but it is working. So let's just move it down a touch. And we'll try that again. Yeah, that looks okay. I might need to just adjust um, the parameters in the instance a little bit more to get it to look good from underneath as well or create a separate shader for it. But that looks okay. So the next thing I want to do is get another post-processing volume in this level and that's going to create the sort of underwater look that I want. So we'll get a post-process volume. There it is. And we're going to drop it just on top of the water for now. And we're going to get a better view of this. There we go. And we're just going to put it roughly in the middle. And we're going to scale it up. So let's scale it in this direction first. And then we'll scale it in this direction too. So it's covering it in both directions. And I'm going to add just a little bit of height to it to make sure that I will always be contained when I'm within it. And then I want to drop it to about there. And then I'm gonna try and put my camera just at kind of where the water is just above me, about there. To make sure that I can see what I want to see. Something like that. Right. So now with that post-process volume selected, we've got everything here that we want. But what I need to make sure happens is that whenever we're in this post-process volume, it shows us the post-processing from it and not the unbound one that's doing the rest of the level. And in order to do that, if I can find it, I think I've got things expanded that I didn't need expanded. Where is it? There it is. It's this priority section. So... Whichever post-process volume has the highest priority when they're overlapping will be the one it shows. So my other one's set to zero. So I'm just going to set this one to one. And now this will be the one that is most important when I'm in both. And I'm also going to drop the blend radius to five. Uh, and then it won't it won't blend. It'll just kind of happen instantly when we when we enter it, or instantly enough. Okay. So now what I want to do is pretty much just set a color on this. That's the main thing I want to do. Okay, so to get the sort of bluey colour that makes us feel like we're in water, with the post-process volume selected, I'm going to go to global. There's this scene colour tint that I can do. I'm going to, first of all, turn it on. 
and then click on the color picker here and you can see that as I move around with this it started to tint the scene so I want it to be quite a deep blue like that and maybe quite dark as well so something like that straight away what I also want to do is add something uh, which is like a an image effect so I'm going to do this chromatic aberration and what that does is just kind of blurs things out a little bit like that which should look kind of nice okay so now what I need to do is get this to change at the right time so you can see the post process at the moment is too high so I want it to change at about there so I need to move it so let's move it down okay move it down a little bit more okay we'll try that yeah that's pretty close so you can see that's changing now pretty much when I dip below the water so let's see what that looks like as we run towards it there's my water it looks all pretty nice enough to swim in got reflections it's all wobbly and when I go below it it goes a bit blue and at this stage if you really wanted to make it look cool you could add more effects to make things look wavy some water sound effects all kind of crazy crap to make this feel like water uh, you could also add some physics to slow your play down as well or add some swimming uh, but overall I'm fairly happy with that so I think the only problem I've got is with what this water is doing when I look at it from underneath uh, but I'm pretty sure that I can fix that by changing some of these options because when I built this water previously I didn't actually have this issue so I don't think it's a huge one So probably by changing things like the base reflectivity, nope. Or this one, nope. Ah, the opacity might do it. So yeah, I think what I would probably be tempted to do is when I was under the water, to have a separate instance where the opacity is set all the way up or change the refraction value that's a lot better oh yes it was refraction look at that it's beautiful so i've got a what am i 1.2 ish for the refraction which at least from underneath looks much nicer so let's just try running into there again yep so the water looks pretty nice we've got reflections i run in and then i look up and everything looks kind of wobbly so we're getting reflections from underneath that looks beautiful. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the bonus steps. As I said earlier, if you've got any questions about this that we've made here, this beautiful water, then drop them in the comments and I will do my best to answer them. I've also promised that I will be leaving this project alone. Uh, unless for some reason inspiration strikes, I'll be working on new things going forward. But maybe, you know, if I decide that I need to do something in this one, I might come back to it. I can't completely rule it out, but I'm fairly sure I'm done. So there are other things coming soon. Um, if you've got any requests, stick them in the comments. If you really want to help me continue making tutorials like these, then please consider checking out the Patreon campaign. Um, you can pledge a little bit, a lot. You can do it for one month. You can do it forever. You cannot do it at all, it's completely up to you, but it does help me keep doing this and it is very much appreciated. If you want to make sure that you're really, really good at Unreal Engine 4 and game art in general, then check out the link in the description to Plural Site. They have hours and hours and hours of content. You can learn so much. As I've said before, that's where I do most of my learning at the moment uh, and I really enjoy it as a platform. Uh, if you do sign up for the free trial using that, they send me a little bit of money for that happening, about three quid. And if you decide you don't like it after the 10 day trial, just cancel it, no bother. So the last thing for me to do in this video is to thank you very much for watching. If you made it to this video, it means you probably watched the previous 40 steps plus these three bonus steps, which is a hell of an achievement. That's like what, over five hours worth of Unreal Engine stuff. You're clearly very committed. So well done, thanks for watching. And I sincerely hope I will see you in my next video. Bye. Thanks for watching.
If you really want to take your learning further than I can cover in this series, then I highly recommend checking out Pluralsight. They have loads of really detailed video courses covering game art and game development using Unreal Engine 4. When I learned how to use Unreal a couple of years ago, this is where I went, and I log in regularly to take a new course and improve my skills. I recommend checking out the Introduction to Unreal Engine 4 course by Joshua Kinney. This is really good and offers a good overview of what you can do in Unreal. You can get a free 10 day trial by using my link in the video description and you get full access to all of their courses for that time. At the end of your 10 days you can either subscribe for more or cancel, totally up to you. It's got to be worth a free trial though right? I'd like to say a massive thank you to my patrons. Your support helps me to keep making videos like this one and I really appreciate each and every one of you. It really blows my mind that people will support my channel and my work by pledging their money through Patreon. So again, thank you all so, so much. If you aren't already a patron and you'd like to offer your support, then please go to patreon.com forward slash Shane Whittington.